All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Malik Parekh, who is in the Philippines. So it's good morning to you. Good morning, John. Uh, nice to be with you. Yeah, uh, Malik is an avid entrepreneur and serial angel investors with uh, angel investor with investments spanning three continents. Uh, and he has written this phenomenal book called, let me just pull it up here, called Future Proof Your Career and Company Flourish in an Era of AI, Digital Natives and the Gig Economy. Um, so let's get straight into it, um, Malik. Um, a lot of people, I think it's safe to say, a lot of people are confused or concerned or about the future because the, the rate of change is so rapid and obviously we had a pandemic now which I think actually has accelerated the digital transformation in our lives probably you know by the fact of at least five to ten years probably so um, how should people what's your advice to people in order to get them to be more at ease with what's happening and to embrace it and actually uh, and actually make it work for them as opposed to just being kind of fearful? I think one way to uh, be less fearful and be excited about the future, John, is to learn more about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Create your own perspective on what the future would be. So one of the chapters in the book that I've written, uh, John, uh, it says that the future is unknown. Be a futurist. Mm -hmm. So every one of us should have two titles, whether we are a doctor, we should also be a futurist. Whether you are a marketing manager, your other titles should be also a futurist. Because if we learn to pay attention to these clues and trends around us, then we can extrapolate those trends, we can synthesize them together and create our own version of what the future may unfold and what opportunities and risks that may present to us. And we can be better prepared for that. So the one way to be less fearful and more hopeful about the future is to actually study, just like we study so many different fields. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point is like, you know, is get involved in, and create the future. Uh, you do talk about, uh, at the beginning of the book, you talk about uh, disruptive forces. And one of them is artificial intelligence. And I, and I feel and I, that, there's been so much written and said about artificial intelligence and hyped, to be honest, in many ways, that I think it has created this uh, confusion around, okay, exactly what's going to happen? Are we going to get replaced? Are we not going to get replaced? And all of that is how uh, you say in another chapter, the future is AI, be a human. Can you explain that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think uh, if you look at artificial intelligence, uh, there are three things that we have to keep in mind, how it would impact our lives and our jobs. Uh, number one, if anything that you are doing as part of your job is repetitive, it's boring, it's predictable, AI will be able to do it. If any part of your job has a vast amount of data from the past that you can feed AI algorithm with, AI will be able to do it. So if you feed uh, AI algorithm with a bunch of memograms studied by the human professionals, very quickly AI algorithm will be able to read memograms better, faster, cheaper, and smarter than the human professionals. And the third thing we have to keep in mind is that the AI is unique. If uh, only thing that you do as part of your job uh, requires basic cognitive skills, such as learning, reasoning, predicting, then those types of jobs could be done by AI. So, you know, for example, when we watch Netflix at home at night or in the morning, whenever given this uh, pandemic, uh, whenever we are watching Netflix, it says, uh, you may also like these recommendations. Mm -hmm. Those recommendations are obviously done by AI. So you have to, each one of us has to ask ourselves this question, what part of my job belongs to this category of tasks that AI will be able to do in the future. And if AI will be able to do that in the future, what are some of the things that will be left for us? So the whole chapter about uh, the future is AI be a human focuses on where do we have an advantage against AI? So, you know, where do we have an innate human advantage against AI? Creativity. AI doesn't have the ability today to create something out of nothing. Only humans mm -hmm. can look at the sunset and be inspired to create a beautiful painting, a masterpiece. AI is not able to do that. Our innate inherent advantage against AI is our ability to 
empathize, to feel other people's feelings. Obviously, there are many companies right now doing a lot of great work in making AI more empathetic, but it's still a long way out. At least for the next 10 years, we won't see AI understanding the concept of compassion, for example. So nice. that's an advantage that we have. The other advantage we have as humans is that we have an innate ability to look at things holistically. You can create an AI algorithm to only focus on one problem. But uh, when COVID-19 situation happened, for example, imagine if AI was the CEO of a company trying to overcome the situation or AI mm -hmm. was the president or the prime minister of a country, it would be completely at loss as what to do. Humans can be resourceful. We can actually be intuitive. We can come up with solutions based on our intuition. So those are some of the things that we have a great advantage of against AI. And those are the things that we should be focusing on and bring out more of. Yeah, so in many ways, uh, people should kind of maybe reorient the way they look at AI. And as you say, look on it as the opportunity to get rid of a lot of, as you say, mundane routine tasks or whatever, and actually focus on higher value creative things. So it, it, in many ways, if you change your thinking towards AI, as you said, like be a human and all the innate human things that AI can't do, it actually makes for a more interesting world and, and, and job probably for you in the future. Absolutely. So uh, you don't have to do, you know, soul shrinking, <laughs> mind numbing activities every day. Uh, you could focus your energy in doing things that make your heart sing to begin with, and it creates a bigger impact in the world around you. Yeah, and I'm also interested that you, um, another chapter you say the future is people, uh, to, to continue on in the human aspect, be an alchemist. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, it's kind of a contrast to the future is AI be a human. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, even at least for the next 10 years, people are not going anywhere. Uh, AI is not going to take over the world to the point where we have nothing to do. So when you go to your work, you still will be dealing with people. And those of us who can become an alchemist, who can bring out the very best in us, but also in others by inspiring them to do things that they never imagined they can do, they would be having their jobs and their careers future-proof because uh, the world would need more of those inspirational leaders going forward. So if you can uh, become uh, like JFK, I give some examples of uh, who are the alchemists in our life. You know, Elon Musk, I believe, is an alchemist. Uh, he's able to put on some incredible visions out there, how he started Tesla, how now he's uh, following his vision to put a human colony on Mars. Now, whether that will happen or not is a different story. But the fact that he's pushing the limits and getting people excited and inspired to achieve those dreams is fascinating and more we need more of that. Yeah, no, and it's interesting here whenever uh, whenever there's a SpaceX launch, uh, you know, people are looking out for it. You know, they're watching out for the sky yeah. to see it because they're they're excited by the vision as well, even if they've got nothing to do with the company. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, one of the things uh, Elon Musk once said in uh, one of the conferences was that um, uh, people asked him, what is his personal vision? What is his personal mission? And he said, well, I want to die on Mars, just not on impact. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's great. <laughs> um, and so the other the other thing is, um, uh, is about digital transformation. Now, I do believe that um, over the over the last decade or so, people have talked a lot about digital transformation, but a lot of people and a lot of companies have paid kind of lip service to it. I think the pandemic changed that, and I think it it really showed a lot of organizations why digital transformation was important and why neglecting it um, was not the smartest thing to do. Uh, what do, you, what do you say around digital transformation? Is this something that companies should really be accelerating right now and putting a lot of resource into? Absolutely. I mean, if there is one silver lining that has come out of this COVID-19, to your point early on, is that it has really accelerated the digital transformation. We had no choice anymore. It became a necessity. It became a way to survive. Forget about thriving, just surviving. And I give a couple of examples in the book, uh, John. Um, if you look at uh, Domino's Pizza, 
I mm -hmm. lived in the U.S. for many years until 2006 before I moved to Asia. I used to go to Domino's Pizza all the time. I used to get deliveries of Domino's Pizza all the time. But back in the days, there were only two ways to order Domino's Pizza. Today, because they have gone through this massive digital transformation way before COVID-19, for the last 12 years, you can order Domino's Pizza 15 different ways. They have an app for it. And on the app, there is a zero click option. You just have to open the page on the app. And after 30 seconds, it automatically orders your favorite pizza and you get that in 30 minutes. They are also now delivering uh, pizza through drone. They were the first company to try to deliver pizza through drone. And now they are working on delivering pizza through autonomous vehicles. What happened? During the pandemic year in 2020, Domino's Pizza's revenue actually grew in double digit than 2019. At the same time, look at the numbers from Pizza Hut, same industry, same business model. Pizza Hut's parent company actually filed for bankruptcy. Why? Because Pizza, was, Pizza Hut didn't proactively digitally transform its business. So this is just one example. So I can take you through so yeah, many no, examples I, around us. That and I think that's, to... uh, yeah, and I think that's a fantastic example because as you said, I mean, it really, it was really looking for ways to make everything simpler and easier and to provide to provide choice uh to provide choice but what it hasn't done is it hasn't diminished the core product right it's 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 in it found more ways to distribute that's right and if you look at the underlying philosophy behind it uh, if you ask any of the executives at Domino's Pizza, they would say that the minor change they made in the way they looked at their business made a big difference. So they used to be just a pizza company. Now they have become a technology company that happens to be in pizza business. Fascinating mm -hmm. way to look at your life. Uh, so everyone has to kind of look at their own business model in no matter what industry you're in and ask yourself how technologically advanced you are, how digitally transformed you are as a company, because that's the only way to thrive and survive. And one more thing I'll add very quickly, John, um, as companies go through this journey of digital transformation, one of the reasons why they fail, and 84% of the companies actually fail at uh, this digital transformation is because most of these companies think that digital transformation is about technology. That if you just go out and buy the latest and the greatest technology out in the marketplace that they heard about in an industrial conference, they would be okay. That's not it. Digital transformation is about three things. Number one, how do you enhance your customer experience? Number two, how do you enhance your employee experience? And number three, how do you revamp or completely change your business model? So those are the end goals and the technology becomes the means to an end. So everything you do has to be focused on achieving these three goals. How can you make your customer experience better? How can you make your employee experience better? And how can you revamp your business model? Yeah, because I think uh, some, or, some companies are still trapped in the, in the approach that maybe uh, came before when, when technology was, was first kind of infusing all the companies. And that's where they looked at technology as a way of making life easier for us internally, yeah. right? Not yes. enhancing the customer experience. That's right. Exactly. So it has to start uh, with the end in mind. And uh, if you can create better value for your customers, if you can make your employees' life happier, uh, they are going to stay longer with you. The um, employee retention goes up. They're happier dealing with your customers. So it's kind of a snowballing effect. It trickles down to every part of your business. And and just and another thing that I just wanted to touch upon here is uh, is you you talk about the future being meaningful and infusing purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. I do think probably one of the the byproducts of the pandemic has been you know people and companies and having having the time out to actually look and maybe explore a little bit more about themselves and what they're doing and maybe also uh it has led people to question well why am i doing what i'm doing and i think that purpose is something that a lot of people overlook and even companies overlook or don't revisit what is exactly your purpose absolutely so you look at some of the most successful companies despite this pandemic are the companies who had an incredibly solid, larger than life purpose. The purpose went beyond just uh, 
making their quarterly business targets, uh, making their sales quota. It was about how they were impacting lives. So for example, if you look at uh, Patagonia, uh, one of my uh, favorite companies when it comes to outdoor wares, mm -hmm. uh, their, their purpose is very simple. They want to protect the environment and preserve the environment for future generations. Uh, look at the purpose of Zappos to deliver happiness. They're not delivering shoes. They're delivering happiness to people. You look at the purpose of JetBlue. It's to inspire humanity both on air and on the ground. So when you look at the companies who are doing really well and well positioned for future growth, are the companies who have been able to inspire not only their employees, but also their consumers with this larger than life purpose. And the reason why it's more important going forward is because of the major demographic shift that is taking place. By 2030, two thirds of our global workforce will be made up of digital natives and Gen Zers. So, mm -hmm. you know, millennials and Gen Zers will not be just the entry level employees or the interns anymore. They may be occupying positions of power and influence. And when you look at these generations, one way they are so different than the others is that they are very purpose driven. They really believe they have the power to change the world because they have the mentors and idols like uh, Greta Thunberg, Malala Yousafzai, both of them Gen Zers and making a huge mm -hmm. impact in the world. So if you want to attract this young generation, both as consumers, your customers, as well as your employees, you would have to offer them more than just a great product. You would have to offer them something they can get excited about, that they feel like if I do business with this company or if I work with this company, I'm also making a difference in the world. Yeah, it, it's almost like... Uh the attachment that uh, you know we have to maybe our sports our sports teams or whatever you know that kind of emotional attachment that goes beyond the product uh, that's that's really kind of transferring now into everything is where we where where people want to have an emotional attachment they want to be a supporter of this company because it says something about them absolutely so how you're perceived as a company is uh, as important as what you are producing what your product and services. Yeah. And finally, uh, Malik, I just wanted to ask you, so, uh, you know, we a lot of talk about change and all of this. And to some people, you know, that's that, as we said at the beginning, that can be quite scary and all of that. But you say the future is fun and you should enjoy the expedition. So what, what's your advice to people who are maybe a little trepidatious about what's coming? I think uh, what I write about in that chapter is that uh, companies have a huge responsibility to create an environment where people are going to have a great time. Because yes, uh, future is always going to be, not only in this decade, it was always uh, extremely anxious. You know, it, it would create anxiety in you. So one way to do that is to make sure as leaders, we create an environment where our employees are having a great time. And I give an example of Southwest Airlines. Um, I'm sure, John, you have traveled uh, by have. Southwest. And uh, when I lived in the US, I look forward to that because I knew that that one hour and a half flight to Dallas or to Austin is going to be fun because the staff on the airline are going to make my life so much more uh, easier and uh, enjoy, right? They, they would make sure that I enjoy the flight. How do they do that, right? Why do other airlines are not able to do that? It's because the basic culture at Southwest is that each one of us is unique and it's okay to bring our uniqueness, our personality to work. Most of the companies, what they do is they want their employees to badge in their personality, their uniqueness when they walk into the door. But if you allow people to bring their personality, their uniqueness, their humor to work, then it becomes easier for people to have a good time with each other and with their customers also. The some, something else that I think companies need to do is that they have to build a culture of trust. You know, if you look at the model of Netflix, um, I have worked with companies where if you look, you ask the HR department, how long is your vacation policy or how long is your travel policy? And they will give you this whole booklet because there are so many nuances of it. At Netflix, the vacation policy is only two words. It says, take vacation. And it trusts the employees that they would do the right thing, that they're not going to take off for a year, <laughs> that they would <laughs> come back to work and make things happen. 
their travel policy is only five words. It says, do what is in interest of Netflix. So it doesn't say you can only charge this much to the company if you're taking your customers out. You can only have one bottle of wine or one glass of beer or whatever. It just allows the employees to make the right decisions. And guess what? Mm -hmm. It works because look at the company and where it's going. No, absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. And yeah, yeah. It, and Southwest it was it was always it's always fun. I used to love when they would say at the end of their flights, uh, "If you've had an enjoyable flight, thank you from Southwest Airlines. If you haven't had an enjoyable flight, this is United." <laughs> <laughs> Only in Southwest Airlines. Only yeah. on Southwest. Absolutely. Like, this has um, been fantastic, Malik. Uh, the, the book is called Future Proof Your Career and Company Flourish in an Era of AI, Digital Natives and the Gig Economy. All of Malik's information will be below this video, links to the book, etc. But before we go, Malik, uh, do you want to tell people just a little bit more about yourself and what you do? Sure. Well, um, so I was a CEO until um, March last year. Uh, it's been years since that I ended uh, that part of my life and I became a full-time author, um, keynote uh, speaker, and also on the side do a little bit of angel investment, uh, especially focused on AI and some of the emerging technologies that would really impact our world outside. So I'm super excited to talk to you, John. And uh, if anybody would like to know more about me, uh, they can obviously visit my website, maldeparek.com. Fantastic. Listen, uh, Malik, this is great, great, uh, great and timely book uh, and timely advice, because as I said, I think the, the future is very bright, but for some people it can be a little, a little bit scary. So I think you've laid out a beautiful roadmap here for people on how to, how to embrace it and, and make the most of it. So thank you for that. Uh, my name thank is John you. Golden to be with from you. South. Yeah, yeah. Thanks again, Malik, and thank you for uh, you know joining us this morning from the other side of the world. I know it's always it's always a little challenging organizing these things, so I really uh, appreciate that. Uh, my name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. <laughs>